We live in an era of unprecedented longevity in football. Medical advancements, more protection from referees, and healthier diets have created a world where many players peak in their 30s, and some even compete at the highest level into their 40s. Pepe was still starring for Porto and Portugal when he retired in the summer, age 41. Luka Modric is still starting games for Real Madrid and Croatia now, age 39. And Thiago Silva is the captain of Fluminense at the grand old age of 40. Heck, you could make the case that a 37-year-old is still the best player on the planet. Not everyone enjoys such extended periods of time, flourishing at the highest level though. Football is an entertainment business after all, and as in the music or film industries, it has had no lack of one-hit wonders. This tweet recently went viral on social media, although I am so out of the loop that I can't tell who it is even mocking. My first thought was Girona, since they're the only club, but does anyone really care about mocking one of the worst supported teams in La Liga? Then there is Benzema, who was obviously exceptional for a very long time, even if he was especially impressive in the 2021-22 season. So maybe it could be about him. And then I saw loads of people mocking Kvitsa Gvarazhelia in the replies, but that makes zero sense to me because he was excellent last season, having been amazing the season before that, despite Napoli's drop-off last season, and he has made another great start this season. So, basically, what I'm saying is that the virality of that meme was lost on me, but it did get me thinking about some of the actual shortest primes in football. Of course, the shortest prime of them all was probably Federico Makeda's, which spanned all of about 30 minutes, when he was subbed on against Aston Villa, and scored a sublime injury time winner for the Red Devils. Makeda was touted as the next Wayne Rooney, Ruud van Nistelrooy, or Cristiano Ronaldo following his debut goal, maybe even the second coming of Jesus Christ, according to some, but Makeda would only ever score three more Premier League goals, and he was soon sent tumbling down to the Championship, Serie B, and currently the Super League Greece. Makeda's career then, much like Jesus, was sacrificed for our sins. Our sins, in this instance of course, being overhyping young players and not giving them the freedom to develop. The likes of Miguel Almiron, Ravel Morrison, and Amir Zaki have also had similarly fleeting purple patches of form, but in today's video, I wanted to focus solely on players who, with respect to those three or four, look to be genuinely world-class, or something very close to that at some stage, before spectacularly regressing to the shadows from which they had once emerged. Even someone like Claudio Bevu, who scored 27 goals and made 7 assists for mid-table Guangon before falling off the face of the earth in the 2014-15 season, didn't quite reach the calibre or reputation required to feature. Meanwhile, the likes of Alexander Pato, Robinho, and even Mario Jardel all did, but their primes were much too long for them to feature. Without further ado then, who obviously had an extremely short prime, very unusually at the age of 14, though he didn't reach the level required to feature, here are seven footballers who were absolutely amazing, but for an unfortunately short period of time. Seventh, Danny Guizza. The ultimate one-season wonder in some ways, Danny Guizza is actually still playing now, age 44, but his time at the top lasted about as long as Chico's. That was a reference to a 2005 X Factor contestant, for any confused viewers. Chico's time in the limelight was so short that I felt that I needed to explain that, which you might think undermines an analogy, but in this instance, if you think about it, it just proves what an excellent choice it was. Danny Guizza, likewise, may well have been forgotten by a lot of especially younger football fans. Unremarkable during his early years, Guizza didn't start playing regular La Liga football until the age of 25. He was a steady Eddie for Getafe, scoring 9 La Liga goals in his first season, and 11 in his second. It was age 27, following a 5 million euro move to Mallorca, that Guizza announced himself to Spanish, and indeed world football. Superlative during his single season in Parma, Guizza scored an astonishing 27 goals in 37 games, for a team that only finished 7th in La Liga, and 29 goals in all competitions. Adding Guizza's 8 assists, and the Spaniard averaged a goal contribution once every 86 minutes, playing for a mid-table club. At the end of the season, he collected both the Bakiki and the Zara Trophy as the top scorer in La Liga, 
ahead of the likes of Sergio Aguero, David Villa, and Raul. What's more, Guizza only took one penalty all season. Ruud van Nistelrooy, who only scored 16 La Liga goals, was somehow nominated for the Ballon d'Or ahead of him, reflecting a certain big club bias when it comes to football's compromised individual awards. Guizza's performance levels were so impressive that he couldn't be overlooked for Spain's Euro 2008 squad, where he scored the winning goal against Greece in the group stage and struck again against Russia in the semi-final, as Spain went on to lift their first major trophy of the modern era. It was obvious that cash-strapped Mallorca wouldn't be able to keep hold of Guizza, who had a 14 million euro release clause and attracted the interest of Arsenal and Liverpool, but it was Fenerbahce, who had just appointed Spain boss Luis Aragonés, who won the race to sign him. The Turkish Super League was stronger back then, but it still seemed a slightly unusual move given the season that Guizza had just had, almost reminiscent of Victor Osimhen's recent move to Galatasaray, after a number of others fell through. Guizza scored 11 league goals and 16 in all competitions in his first season in Turkey, in which Fenerbahce finished fourth and Aragonés lost his job. His second season was much of the same, but after a return to Getafe, Guizza only scored three La Liga goals all season and looked to have been stripped of the confidence and instinctiveness that had made him unplayable just a few years earlier. Now age 44, Guizza has since played in Malaysia and Paraguay, and he now plays for Atenia in the regional Primera Division Andaluza at step 7 of the Spanish Football League pyramid. For a brief moment though, Guizza was among the most lethal forwards on the planet, finishing second in the battle for the 2007-08 European Golden Shoe to Cristiano Ronaldo, while playing for Mallorca despite playing 9 games fewer than Ronaldo and not being on penalties. So... Not bad. Sixth, Adriano. An obvious inclusion, the only question mark with Adriano, in relation to this seven, is how long was his prime? You could make the argument that it spanned all the way from the 2002-03 season, which was his first at Parma, to the 2005-06 season, which was his third at Inter Milan, in which case, while still only four years, and sadly fleeting for someone so talented, it would probably be a bit too long to feature. In reality, that first season at Parma only heralded 15 league goals, and Adriano wasn't yet at his scintillating best, and his third at Inter already showed significant signs of regression. Adriano's true peak, therefore, in which he was truly one of the best centre-forwards on the planet, came between 2003 and 2005. A freak of an athlete and unbelievably complete as a striker, Adriano had a powerful 6 foot 2 inch frame, unerring technique, and he could score goals from every angle. In two seasons, he struck 49 times in 73 games for Parma and Inter Milan, in addition to making 9 assists at a time when Serie A was a brutal league in which to score goals. For Brazil, meanwhile, Adriano scored 19 goals in 23 games, lighting up the 2005 Confederations Cup, where he scored braces against both Germany and Argentina, and won both the Golden Boot and the Golden Ball. At that point, Adriano was getting best player in the world shouts. He was somewhat unfortunate to only rank 6th and 7th in 2004 and 2005 Ballon d'Or voting, and he was touted as Ronaldo's heir in the Brazil team. Unfortunately, while Ronaldo had his own severe injury and health problems, significantly reducing his prime, Adriano's departure from the limelight was to be much more sudden and painful. The death of his father shook Adriano to his core, plunging him into a deep depression, which would come to be reflected in his performances. It's worth noting, Adriano was only aged 21 to 23 in his prime, his best years still ought to have been ahead of him. He failed to regain his passion for the sport at Inter following his father's death though, and after a brief renaissance at Flamengo, a 2011 Achilles injury destroyed Adriano's physical prowess, and with it, any aspirations that he had of competing at the highest level. Over the next few years, Adriano only managed to play 11 games, scoring 3 goals before hanging up his boots. In his own words, referring to his father's death and his Achilles injury in 2021, Adriano said, quote, I have a hole in my ankle and one in my soul. It may have been brief then, but for those who witnessed it, Adriano's peak was unforgettable. 
and it is a testament to his ferocious talent during that time that he still ranks among the top 20 goal scorers of all time for the greatest national team in the history of the sport. Fifth, Salvatore Scalacci. A World Cup icon, West Germany may have won Italia 90 and Argentina reached the final, but arguably the most memorable and iconic moments of that tournament were Frank Ray Gard spitting at Rudy Vola, Gazza's tears, and Salvatore Scalacci's piercing eyes. Scalacci only made his debut for Italy in their final World Cup warm-up game, but he not only made their squad for Italia 90, he came off the bench to score the winning goal in their opening game against Austria, and from there, he never looked back. Goals against Czechoslovakia, Uruguay, the Republic of Ireland, Argentina and England followed, as Italy finished third and Scalacci took home the golden boots and the golden ball. His World Cup was both the culmination of and the crowning moment in an amazing season for Scalacci, in which he scored 21 goals and won a Coppa Italia and UEFA Cup double in his first season at Juventus. 15 league goals might not sound like much now, but Serie A at the time was both immensely competitive and uber defensive, and Marco van Basten, Roberto Baggio and Diego Maradona, quite literally three of the greatest footballers of all time, were the only players to score more than him, meanwhile Rudy Voller and Jurgen Klinsmann both scored fewer. The combination of his cup successes, goal scoring and sensational World Cup, and Scalacci's second place in 1990 Ballon d'Or voting, behind West Germany's World Cup winning star man Lothar Matthäus. But what makes Scalacci's story all the more remarkable is that the 1989-90 season, which ended with him being named as the best player in a World Cup, was his first season playing top flight football of any description. For the previous seven years, Scalacci had been playing second and third tier football for Messina. Unfortunately, the following season, Scalacci could only manage five goals in Serie A and eight in all competitions, which fell to seven the season after that. He joined Inter Milan in 1992 in an attempt to revitalise his career, but by that stage, persistent injuries, particularly a recurring issue with his knee, made life difficult for Scalacci, who was such an explosive striker at his best. He ended his career scoring prolifically again in Japan, but at that time, the J-League was not an especially formidable division, certainly not comparable to Serie A. Scalacci sadly died just last month, aged only 59, two years after being diagnosed with colon cancer. But for those magical nights in 1990 when he made a nation dream, his memory will forever live on. Fourth, Papi Cisse. Almost the perfect inclusion in this seven, while Salvatore Scalacci made a nation dream in 1990, Papi Cisse's start to life at Newcastle United still almost feels like a dream. There was a sort of mystical or otherworldly quality to Cisse's ethereal peak in which everything he touched seemed to turn to gold. You could argue that it started in the 2010-11 season, which was Cisse's only full season at Freiburg, in which he scored 22 goals in the Bundesliga and 24 in all competitions for a team that finished 9th. Only Bayern Munich talisman Mario Gomez scored more than him in Germany that season. Cisse picked up as he left off the following season with 9 goals in 17 games before Newcastle United signed him for just £9.3 million in the January transfer window. Alongside Denver Barr, who Newcastle signed on a free transfer, the two would briefly form one of the greatest pound-for-pound -pound strike partnerships of all time. Over the next four months, Cisse scored 13 goals in 14 games for Newcastle, which included scoring the winner on his debut, braces against West Brom, Swansea and Liverpool, and, most famously, an unforgettable brace against Chelsea. The first goal was impressive enough, a beautiful and instinctive touch and volley that sailed past Petr Cech, but the second, a bizarre semi-volley of a bouncing ball from an ungodly angle, which seemed to have more swerve than it should be possible to inject into a football, was just utterly stupefying. Under any other circumstance, you'd dismiss it as a fluke and pure luck. From Cissé, at that moment in time and in that form, it was at least feasible to imagine that he might actually have meant it. 
make no mistake, Cissé, like every other player in this seven, was immensely talented and had his moments outside of his prime, but he was playing second-tier football just two years before joining Newcastle. He scored only 13 in 47, rather than 13 in 14 for them the following season, and he soon headed to China, Turkey, and back down to Ligue 2 in France. Those two years at Freiburg and at Newcastle then, and especially those six months at Newcastle, were unlike anything else that Cissé produced. And during that time, he was legitimately one of the most devastating strikers within the sport. Third, Papillo. Papillo is a name that might not be instantly recognisable to most modern football fans. In fact, even in his own day, he was sometimes referred to as Papillo II, so as not to be confused with the former Sevilla star, Jose Diaz Payan, who was also nicknamed Papillo. There are only three photos featuring Papillo in the entire Getty database, so, uh, as is tradition, at times I will have to include images of the Romanian singing duo The Cheeky Girls instead. Obviously. Real name Jose Garcia Castro, Papio II's prime was as brief as it was brilliant. Born in Melilla, one of two colonial Spanish enclaves in North Africa, Papio made his name with Sevilla, with whom he had an outstanding goal-scoring record. Five years after making his debut for Sevilla, Papio joined the European champions Real Madrid. For Papio, it meant the daunting prospect of competing, primarily, with Alfredo Di Stefano for a starting bar. The best player on the planet at the time, and still, I would argue, at least one of the four or five greatest of all time, Di Stefano had a couple of injury setbacks during Papillo's debut campaign, presenting him with a golden opportunity. To say that Papillo grasped that opportunity with both arms would be a significant understatement. Papillo struck 13 times in only 12 appearances in the league in his debut campaign, and 22 times in 18 appearances in all competitions, as Madrid won yet another European Cup. As debut campaigns go, it wasn't a bad one. Unfortunately, Di Stefano was back before long, actually wrestling back his place in time for the European Cup final, and Papillo soon found himself on loan in South America with River Plate, followed by moves to Mallorca and Malaga. A brilliant, skillful, and lethal forward, Papillo's prime, which saw him nominated for a Ballon d'Or, wasn't that short, about 1956 to 1960, but he went from one of the best players on the planet during that time to an outcast at Madrid, aged only 27, and an afterthought at both Malaga and Mallorca. I could only assume that he must have had some injuries, but having scoured the web and asked anyone who I thought might know, I haven't yet found a proper explanation as to why Papillo bowed out so quickly, or indeed, why he never won a senior cap for Spain. So, if you are an expert on mid-20th century Spanish football and happen to be watching this video, please enlighten us all in the comments. Second, Grafic. For one season and one season only, Grafic wasn't just the best striker in the Bundesliga, or even just one of the best strikers in the world, he was among the best of the modern era. Oh, and uh, just to clarify, his name is pronounced Grafic in Brazilian Portuguese, not Grafite or Grafite before anyone says it in the comments, like the last time that I talked about him. Look, I may mangle the pronunciations of a lot of names on this channel, and I am happy to be lambasted when I do, but... This one is right, and if there are any Brazilians in the comments, please back me up on this issue and don't hold my video about why Brazil have stopped winning everything against me. Grafic burst onto the scene. I, I burst onto the scene, didn't I? With Goyas and Sao Paulo in Brazil, but by that point, he was already in his mid-twenties, so he never came close to representing Brazil at youth level. Grafic's status as a late bloomer perhaps warded some European clubs off signing him, but in January 2006, newly promoted league Gun side, Le Mans finally took the plunge. Grafic scored 20 goals in 56 games for Le Mans over the next two years, before joining Wolfsburg for 5.6 million euros. Managed by the eccentric Felix Magat, Grafic was partnered alongside the indomitable Edin Dzeko. In their first half season together, Grafic and Dzeko formed a magical partnership, but it was the following year, in their first full season, that they really set the world alight. Between them, they scored 71 goals, Dzeko netting 36 times in 42 outings, and Grafic an even more remarkable, 35 times in only 31 appearances, as Wolfsburg won their first and still their only Bundesliga title. 
Grafic won the Bundesliga Golden Boots, with Dzeko finishing as runner-up, but Grafic's contribution that season extended far beyond goals. A big, powerful centre-forward, not unlike Dzeko, at 6'2", while also having lightning-quick feet and boundless confidence and invention that season, there seemed to be some kind of supernatural force surrounding Grafic, which made him virtually untouchable. Nothing sums that up better than the goal that he scored against title rivals Bayern Munich, in which he humiliated half of the Bayern team, including the goalkeeper, before backheeling the ball past three players, scrambling to keep up with him. One of those players was Philipp Lahm. Over 15 years on, I have seen few more impressive goals than that, and almost none that summed up the extraordinary vein of form that a player was in. It was insulting to any right-thinking person's sense of moral decency that Grafic wasn't even nominated for the 2009 Ballon d'Or. Arguably, he should have made the podium. Grafic still hit double figures the following season, 11 goals in the league and 18 in all comps, before scoring goals for fun in the UAE, but for a fleeting moment, he ascended to the level of a footballing god, and not even Lionel Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo could keep up with his rate of goal scoring that season. First, Michu. Maybe it is predictable, perhaps even a little bit boring, especially if you were hoping for a Papio style HITC7's rabbit out of the hat in top spot, and a player that you'd never previously heard of, but none of that changes the fact that I think it is true. Michu's prime was both laughably brilliant, as he made mincemeat of what was meant to be the best league in the world, for a club of modest means and stature, having arrived a little fanfare, whilst also being so transient that if you blinked for too long, in either 2012 or 2013, you may well have missed it. Michu came from humble beginnings in football. His first five seasons were spent in the third and fourth tiers of Spanish football, with Celta Vigo's B team and his hometown club Real Oviedo. When he eventually broke into the first team at Celta in the Spanish Segunda Division, Michu only scored two goals in 42 games from attacking midfield in his first two seasons. His next two were a little bit more impressive, catching the eye of Rayo Vallecano, who handed him his La Liga debut in 2011 at the age of 25. Michu's sole season in Madrid was a sensation, as he scored over twice as many goals for Vallecano in La Liga as he had done for any of his previous clubs in the three divisions below that. Despite being the ninth highest scorer in La Liga for a team that was almost relegated, when Swansea City signed Michu the following summer for a bargain basement £2 million, it was a transfer which made few headlines. On his debut, however, Michu forced the English press to start talking about him, scoring two and assisting one in a 5-0 win. Michu scored in each of his next two games against West Ham and Sunderland, in a season in which he would score twice against Manchester United and three times against Arsenal. Prior to a festive clash against the Red Devils, Alex Ferguson described Michu as a first-class piece of business, joking, quote, just £2 million, and I'd never really heard of him. I should have a word with my scouting department. End quote. Despite identifying Michu as Swansea's primary threat, Fergie was powerless to prevent the Spaniard from scoring yet again in a one-all draw. Michu started the following season just as he'd left off, but in November, he suffered a knee injury which Swansea rushed him back from. Such was his importance to them. On his return, Michu picked up another injury, this time spraining his ankle. It began a cycle of repeated long-term injuries, from which Michu could never recover. Moves to Napoli, Langreo, and his hometown club, Oviedo, followed, but the pain was too great, and Michu retired age 31. Ultimately, Michu played top-flight football for the first time at 25, and suffered what would prove to be a career-ending injury at 27, but during the intervening two or so years, he was a force of nature, one of the best players in the Premier League, and he earned a late call-up and cap for Spain in a squad that was immensely competitive and at the peak of their powers. Michu's demise was a tragedy in football terms, but a heroic tragedy for someone who made a greater impact in 12 or 24 months than most players do in 20 years. Michu's impact was so great that Erling Haaland idolised him growing up, describing how he would try to emulate the Spaniard in games and in training, and he's turned out half-decent as a result. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much, as ever, for watching. 
Hit the like button if you enjoyed it. I sincerely hope that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. And of course, it goes without saying, make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on, not just for this channel, uh, HITC7s, but also my second channel, Alfie Pot Sama, where I recently uploaded my fourth video. So go and check all of those out. Uh, both of which should be about to appear on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might fancy watching after this one. You can also find me on Twitter, Instagram, or threads via the username at hitc 7 on all three, should you wish to do so. And all of those links, plus a whole lot more, should be down in the video description below.